Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. Ah, I got the intro right this time. When we left off, Greece was about to rip itself apart. It had broken into two factions. Athens and its empire, and a couple of friends, like Plataea. Remember, Plataea is, is Athens' own boy. So the, it's in Athens' empire, but it's like an ally. Like, and there are a few cities that are like that. They're, they're big enough, they're powerful enough, they're rich enough that they can talk to Athens and be, or they have a relationship, like Plataea is small, but remember, even the meanest, even the most selfish, even the most greedy of Athenians, and remember, Athens is still a democracy where the majority still wins, remember that the only people who showed up to help the Athenians at Marathon were the Plataeans. So they're like, psh, homeboys. There is no, in a democracy, there is no desire to sell out your friends. They're like, no way, man. The Plataeans could do no wrong. So it's Athens and their empire and a couple of their friends. Which is basically Athens saying, it's democracy for me, but not for you. You have to live under what I tell you. Which is interesting, right? Because in my last episode, I said, when they destroy the city... They put a democracy in charge of it. But see, they put the democracy in charge of it to vote always with Athens. So it was never really a democracy because it could never choose its own path. So, so this is going to be a 30-year war. There's going to be a couple breaks in it, but it's almost 30 years of war of the Greeks fighting each other. And it's Athens and its few friends versus what's called the Peloponnesian League. P E L O P O N N. E-S-I-A-N, P-E-L-O-P-O-N-N-E-S-I-A-N, the Peloponnesian League. It's Sparta, Thebes, Corinth, and others. And their, their theme is Sparta going freedom for the Greeks, freedom of the Greeks, but no democracy. You can have freedom, but not democracy. Because Sparta is talking about that Athenian empire, and he's saying, autonomia, everyone should live under their own rules, freedom of the Greeks. Remember this saying because it's going to come back. But this is the slogans. Athens, democracy for me, but not for you. And Sparta, freedom of the Greeks. You can see who already has an advantage. And the, why are the Spartans in this? Why are the Spartans in this? Because they're the only ones who are powerful enough to take on Athens. They're it. But remember, they withdrew from politics. They went down to Peloponnese. They they have their slaves. But here's the problem, right? Way back in the day, the Spartans beat up a city that outnumbered them. By like a lot. I think the Thucydides or Herodotus will say it's 9 to 1, 10 to 1. It can't be that big. Not in the ancient world. Not in the world before guns. Can you can you can you enslave a people that much bigger than you? But let's say it's three to one. Someone got the bright idea that if we use these people as as slaves, what's called helots, H E L O T S, Greek slaves. If we keep these fellow Greeks as slaves, we won't have to work. It'll be great. And he went, yeah. They'll farm for us. They'll do our work for us. I could sit on my porch and drink iced tea. Sweet tea. It would be awesome. I'll compose poetry and the kids can sing it during our, you know, fertility ceremonies. But here's the problem. So they do that. And there's a problem. One, they're outnumbered. And two, Greeks are terrible slaves. Because they believe in freedom and autonomia. Eleutheria, freedom. And autonomia, autonomy. And slavery has neither. So you don't keep fellow Greeks as slaves. You beat them up, you fight your wars, and either you make a treaty, or if you capture something back, you sell them to the Persians, you sell them to the Egyptians, you sell them to the Illyrians and the Thracians, to barbarian peoples. You don't keep them for yourself because they're just going to murder you in your sleep. Because that's dumb.
and the Spartans do it. And then they realize, oops, kind of Thomas Jefferson, you, own, you have a wolf by the ears. You don't like it, but you can't let it go. They realized, one, the helots are doing all the work for them, so they can't stop owning them. But the helots hate them. Hate them. Herodotus says the helots would eat them raw. So like all slave owners, the Spartans are petrified of revolt, of a slave revolt. And so like the American South, what do the Spartans invest in? Their military, their army. And they become the only professional army in Greece. Why do they become the only professional army in Greece? Because they're the only ones with enough slaves, like the Assyrians, to be able to feed them so that their men could be professional soldiers instead of farmers. Sparta is admired in Greece, but they are weird. Nobody else is like them. They And they're considered weird at the time. There are stories. The, the Spartans never tell us any stories. They don't write anything down for us. So we have other people's stories. And they always come off with a... Let me tell you about how weird the Spartans are, dude. And they, they these are these stories. Now they admire them. Because the Spartans like don't lie and they're physically fit and they're tough and they never run away in battle and they like don't cheat people. They don't even use money. And it's like all oh, and they're more feminist than everybody else because the women have to be tough too. And there's an admiration of the kind of unity of Sparta, even while at the same time being like, you dudes are weird. So I'll give you a good example. Um, this is a story I heard. I haven't read it. It might be from Plutarch, but because great stories always come from Plutarch. But it's this story of, let's call it the Olympics. Let's just call it the Olympics. And the seats are all crowded. All the seats are taken. And there's an old man. His cane. He's looking for a seat. Can I have that one? No, man, take it. Can I have that one? No, no, no. Because he's, you know, he's a little smelly looking. He's old. You know, you know, like people are trying not to look at him and they're looking straight and hey, you know, and he gets all the way. He starts in the back. Nobody will because he's like, dude, I'll find a seat in the back. Right. There's nothing up front. I'll find it. And he walks his way all the way down till he gets to the front where there's a Spartan mentor and like his line of like 13 year old recruits. They all get up. Old man, have my seat. No, old man, have my seat. My seat's better, old man. Take my seat. Now, you're not calling him old man. I call him grandfather. Grandfather, take my seat. Grandfather, take my seat. No, 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 no. Honor me by taking my seat. I'll stand. And whether it's Plutarch or Thucydides, it might be Thucydides. It might be Herodotus. Herodotus likes telling these kind of stories. They say the same thing. All the Greeks knew what the right thing to do. All the Greeks knew he was an old man. Give up your seat. But only the Spartans were willing to do it. And that was the admiration of Sparta. And so when the Athenians start scaring people, they go to the Spartans. And the Corinthians are very good at this because the Corinthians say to the Spartans, dude, they're a democracy. They believe in freedom. What do you think the Athenians are going to do to your helots, to your slaves? You think they're going to be cool with you keeping your slaves? No, man. They're democracy. They hate slavery. They're going to want to free your slaves. And the helots damn well are going to want to be freed by them. So you got a problem, dude. I don't like Athens. Because I have a navy, and their navy is better than my navy, and they're taking all my money. Thebes don't like them, because their army is actually now better than the Theban army. And taking over places in the north. All the places Thebes wants to take over, they're all allied for protection with Athens. That leaves you, man. What are you going to do? Whose side are you on? Because you can't sit this one out. You can lead us. 
or you're going to be destroyed by Athens. And Sparta says, I will lead. And this creates the tinderbox. Greece is now divided into Athens and Sparta and their allies. All they need is something to happen. And in 431, it does. Now, we don't have to go into this. We're going to go into four stages of what happens. Stage one is a stalemate. Ten years. 431 to 421 BCE. Athens has its navy. Sparta has its army, which ended up, they can't hurt each other. Everybody thought, like World War I, this would be a short war. Because the Athenian, um, the Spartan army would walk into Attica, the Athens land, burn stuff down. The Athenian army, made up of Democrats, would say, F this, man, we're going to fight. They'd vote to have a battle. They would march out. There would be a one giant battle where Sparta... Corinth and Thebes would all gang up versus Athens, Plataea, and a couple of other allies. And then it'd be like, boom, one battle over. The rest of the world can go on. And either Athens will own the world or Athens has to give up his empire. One or the other. The Athenians don't do that. The Athenians have a navy. They can't be starved out. They could just bring in money, bring in food from the ally, from the allies, but also from the from the empire. Now the Athenian men want to go fight the Spartans, Urgh. but Pericles, the leader of Athens, says, "No, no, 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 no. We'll fight them in other places. We don't have to fight the Spartan army because we might lose, but we'll fight them here and there. We have the navy; we can go anywhere. And so ultimately, they can't hurt each other. So what do they do?" burn down each other's allies. Sparta attacks Plataea. Athens attacks um, Spartan allies in the Peloponnese. And one of the famous scenes is the Melian dialogue. The city of Milos, the city of Milos revolts, listens to Sparta say, freedom of the Greeks, and they revolt against the Athenians. As soon as they do, the Spartans go, oh, thanks, but we can't help you. We don't have a navy. So Milos is on its own. And the Athenians lay siege to the city. They eventually burst in. It takes them months. It's extremely expensive. They burst into the city. They capture it. They tear down those walls. And then what do we do? How do we treat Milos, this little city? What do we do? And the general sends word back to Athens, says, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And this is done in Thucydides. And what the democracy did after three days of debate was choose genocide, murder all of the men, sell the women into slavery. You can murder the kids if you want, or you sell them too into slavery. Sends back the word. Now remember, a democracy voted on this. They debated it for three days, and then they voted on it. And they voted murder and genocide. So the word comes back. And the leading Melian people are like, so uh, what, did the, what did your democracy say? And the general looks at him and goes, um, that you're all going to die. And they go, wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. We just revolted. We didn't, what do you mean we're all going to die? And the general says, shut up. Shut, just shut up. And then he gives one of my favorite quotes in all of history and one of the most chilling ones in all of history. And it's quoted in Thucydides. Quote, you know as well as we do that right as the world goes, is only a question between equals and power. While the strong do what they will, the weak suffer what they must. And I am the strong, and you are the weak. This is Hobbes. This is Hobbesian philosophy. This is right makes, might makes right. This is one of the throughputs of all of history is I don't have to negotiate with you. 
This is your mom yelling at you when you're a teenager. I don't have to negotiate. We are not equals. Equals negotiate. You are weak. And I am strong. And you are going to suffer what I decide you will suffer. And Athens, in this case, is going to murder the 5,000 people of Milos. For you, it was it was being grounded or not having your phone or not being able to hang out with your friends. It is power. It is a statement of power. And it's one of my favorite quotes because it's naked. It doesn't, it's not romantic. It doesn't uh, pretty up history. It says the relationship right up front. It reminds you Don't lose. If there is one law of history, it is don't lose. Losing is bad. It's always going to end up, it's always going to end bad. Whether you're the Milesians, whether you're the Carthaginians, whether you're the Byzantines, whether you're, don't lose. Why else do I pick the Milian dialogue? Because an Athenian democracy chose genocide. You have grown up in an age where only Nazis do genocide. Where socialist dictatorships, tyrannies do, do genocide. No. Democracies can choose genocide as well. They can listen. They can debate. They can choose the pros and cons. And then they can decide to murder all of their enemies just because they're their enemies. Democracies are not any morally better than any other government. The Spartans are a slave state. They own slaves. And yet they are fighting for freedom of the Greeks. The Athenians believe in freedom and democracy and they're choosing genocide. Remember that the United States was the only country to drop nuclear weapons on another country. Remember that. We chose to do that. That horror. And there's lots of reasons to say we should have. There's also lots of reasons to say we shouldn't have. But we chose to unleash nuclear annihilation on an entire city, something that had never been done before. So democracies can do evil things. And Athens does. And exactly what the Milesians say is going to be a problem, becomes a problem, because they say, if you murder us, you're telling everybody who ever revolts, they they have to fight to the end. They can never surrender. You will never respect their surrendering. You will never respect a treaty with them. And for the rest of the war... Athens is going to have to spend a lot more time fighting re- revolters, people who revolt against them, rebellions, than they they had than they had to. Soft power, the idea of people liking Athens, they don't like Athens. That's us in a post-Roman, post-Christian, post-Renaissance, post-Reformation world. We like Athens, but the other Greeks, they committed a genocide. Sparta is a slave state, but they're fighting for freedom of the Greeks. This is a trauma for for Greece. This stalemate, every major city in Greece, every minor city, I should say, because the major cities are powerful enough to survive, but most minor cities, Plataea, are burned. They're burned to the ground. The Spartans will burn Athenian allies to say, we can do this to you. Athens can't help you. Well, the Athenians do the same thing to Spartan allies, saying the Spartans can't help you. By 421, everyone is exhausted and you have a timeout. From 421 to 415, there's a timeout. Nobody, now this is why it's called a timeout. Yeah, there's a treaty, but nobody expects the treaty to last forever. Everybody knows we're going back to war. It's everyone's exhausted. So you need to gather up their ships. They need to gather up their men. They need to gather up their armies. They need to, they need to rebuild to fight round two. And round two starts when the Athenians attack Sicily. And you should go, what? 
What? Who? Huh? He? Who? What? Why would the attack? Why would the Athenians, who are on East Greece, attack Sicily, which is way in the west? It's like a four-day boat ride. One, the Athenians have a navy; they can go anywhere. Two, who do you think is supplying the food? to the Peloponnesian League, to Sparta and its allies. Now, the Spartans have slaves, so they're cool. But what about Corinth? What about Thebes? What about these other Spartan allies? Well, they're getting their food from Sicily and southern Italy. And so the idea is you can conquer Sicily. If you could conquer Sicily, which itself was having a war between lots of different cities... If you could conquer city city for Athens, one, you'd be the richest people in the Greek world. But also, two, you could win the war without fighting the Spartan army. You don't have to fight the Spartans. Because you could starve them out. Because without food, Corinth can't be in the war. Without food, Thebes can't be in the war. It would leave the Spartans by themselves, and the Spartans can't defeat Athens by itself. It doesn't have a navy. It needs the allies. It's not big enough. So all the Athenians need to do is win in Sicily. Conquer Syracuse. Win in Sicily. And it's a disaster. They sent the wrong general who was very superstitious. All kinds of crazy stuff happens. The allies are, of course, useless. If you've ever been in Iraq or Afghanistan... You know you end up doing all the fighting yourself. The allies, all these people, all these tribesmen are going to be allies. Yeah, they're useless. They're always, they always overpromise. I've got 10,000 men to help you. You show up, they got none. They got three old guys and a kid who's like 12. They have no horses. They have no infrastructure, nothing. They promised the Athenians lots of stuff. They promised when Athenian shows up, they will be welcomed as liberators. Guess what happened? It's a disaster. 40,000 men die. They go off to Sicily. They never come back. That's 25% of all the men of Athens. To put that in perspective, remember, the United States has been at war in Afghanistan for 20 years. And less than 1% of Americans have gone to fight in Afghanistan. In Sicily, one in four men in Athens, of military age, went to uh, to Sicily, and they didn't come back. This is a demographic disaster. This is plague level disaster. This is a trauma for Athens. And you get the work Lysistrata by Euripides, the playwright Euripides, E U R I P I D E S. E-U-R-I-P-I-D-E-S. Euripides writes this play called Lysistrata. L-Y-S-I-S-T-R-A-T-A. L-Y-S-I-S-T-R-A-T-A. And Lysistrata is crazy. One, it's a comedy. Two, it's a sex comedy, which the Greeks liked. The Greeks loved bawdy Physical, sexual humor. Loved it. They love a good fart joke. But Lysistrata is crazy because Lysistrata is a woman. And it's the first anti-war play ever written. See, war was the way boys became men. So whether it's the Bible whether it is Gilgamesh, whether it is Ramses II and his stories, war is a good thing. War's hard, but it's honorable. It turns boys into men. You want to go to war. Lysistrata says war is useless. It also says women matter. Now, how do women matter? Women matter in Lysistrata because... They decide to end the war. They all get together. And they say, we're going to end this war. And we're going to stop. The only thing men like more than war. And that's the nookie. We're going to stop them from having the nookie. And when we stop them from having the nookie, they will have to decide 
whether they like killing each other or making love. We make love, not war. That's what Lissa Strata is talking about. And at first, nobody likes that idea. The women are like, whoa, this sounds like it's worse for me than it is for them. And you have to understand, in a pre-Victorian world, in a pre-1835 to now world, in the ancient world, women were lustier than men. Women liked sex more than the men did. Because the men had other things to do. They had poetry. They had politics. They had trade and and capitalism. Right? All women had was sex and babies. So, that's all they had. They and uh, Some religion stuff. And they could do other things. But the idea was women liked sex more than the men. And Freud will talk about this. Freud will have a thing. Freud has the entire, his part of his entire philosophy is civilization is built when you're not having sex. And since men build civilization, or so the idea was, if men and women just had sex, no civilization wouldn't, it wouldn't exist. School wouldn't exist. Pyramids wouldn't exist. Uh, uh, plays wouldn't exist because you can't write a play when you're having sex. And so Lysistrata gets the women and convinces them, look, this war is bad. It's murdering our young men. It's murdering our husbands, our future husbands, our sons. We have to stop it. And so the women go on a sex strike. And it shows women matter, especially if they work together. Remember, up to this point, women don't matter. They're children. And now all of a sudden, they're making, pol- they're doing politics. And it's also to tell you, women are affected by war. And that's what Euripides is telling us. Women are affected by war. You think there's a great speech where the men are, where the general is like, why is this a problem for you? And Lisa Stry goes, because you're killing our, our husbands. Well we're, well, we're getting dead. Doesn't that suck for us? It's like, yes, that's sad for you, but no one wants to remarry. Any old man can marry a 20-year-old. All of these women only have one shot at a husband. And you're taking it away from them. You are making it so that women can't become women. You are le- While you boys can become men, us girls can't become women. Because we won't be able to get married. And we won't be able to have children. And that's what your war is doing to us. And in the end, they decide to have a peace treaty and all make love. And it's a comedy. A very bawdy comedy. Well, while that's the play, the war continues. In fact, the war picks up because now Athens is hurt. For the first time in the entire war, Athens looks weak. They're also going to lose a battle at Delium, D-E-L-I-U-M, badly to the Thebans. So they, they lose on land and at sea. But here's the realization. So Athens knows it's weak. So what Athens does is is close in. They build up their walls. They build up their defenses. They got their navy. If you want to defeat Athens, you have to defeat the navy. You have to smash that navy. That navy is bringing them in money. That navy is bringing them food. That navy brings them in allies and more men. And what the Spartans decide is we must beat that navy. And what happens is the bloodbath in the Aegean. The next 10 years from 411 to 404 is the bloodiest period of conflict in the Peloponnesian War. 10% of all Greek men will die. 100,000 Greek men will die either be killed in battle or drown. So to defeat the Athenian Navy, what do they need? An endless supply of men, an endless supply of money, an endless supply of wood. And there's only one group out there who hates the Athenians who matches that endless supply of men, money, and wood. And that's Persia. The Persians, remember the Persians lost twice to the Athenians. 
The only people to ever defeat the Persians are the Athenians. And so Athen Persia hates the Athenians too. And so when Sparta shows up and says, help us defeat Athens, Persia says, where do I sign? Now, Persia can't actually join the war because that would look bad, right? It's, for, it's fighting for freedom of the Greeks. But Persia can open up its checkbook and that's what it does. But before it signs that first check, that first check that basically they're going to just say, Sparta, you just write in the number you need. They say, we want Ionia back. Athens took it from us. We want it back. You can't stop us from taking it. And the Spartans, who have been fighting for freedom of the Greeks, look at the map and say, okay, you can have it. And the Spartans sell the Ionians out to Persian slavery. Now, the Persians don't need Ionia. They're doing it for the rep. They're doing it to get it back. They're doing it because the Athenians took it. It's salt in the wound. It's, 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 it's juice in the eye. Lemon juice in the eye. It's we're going to take it because we can. And you're going to let us if you win. And the Spartans, who have been fighting for freedom of the Greeks, look at the Ionians and say, they're your slaves. You do what you want. Now, this does not mean Athens immediately loses. They build a fleet. They man that fleet. And the Athenians, who are better at naval warfare, smash that fleet. So they build another fleet. And the Athenians smash that fleet. Because the Athenians now know their back is against the wall. They must defeat every fleet the Spartans and the Persians build. They have to. But here's the thing. It's endless amounts of men because the Spartans with the Persian checkbook can hire mercenaries from all over the Persian world. It's an endless amount of money because the Persia is the greatest empire in the entire world. It owns Babylon, it owns Egypt, and it owns Lydia. And it has an endless supply of wood. In fact, the Persians might run out of wood before they ran out of men or money. But they had the money so they could buy the wood from other places because the, the Middle East doesn't have a lot of forests. So fleet after fleet gets smashed by the Athenians. But in every battle, the Athenians lose five ships, two ships, three ships. And so they're getting weaker. All it takes is one defeat. And that's the end of Athens. And 404, an Athenian naval defeat happens. And a Persian fleet led by a Spartan admiral sails into the Athenian port and ends the only democracy that has ever existed on earth the spartans won the peloponnesian war they sold the the per they sold the ionians into slavery they held on to the helots their own slaves and they ended the athenian democracy so what are the results the results are that athens is exhausted poor and weak. It is no longer the economic engine of Greece. And what you get is a Greek economic depression because the Athenians used to buy everybody's stuff and then sell it. They were the middlemen of Greece. They buy it and sell and buy and sell. So you could always sell stuff to the Athenians because the Athenians with their Navy could always take it to other richer people to sell it. Now you get an economic depression after the Peloponnesian War. How do I know? How do you know it's an economic depression? Because poor men start selling themselves as mercenaries into Persian army. The Greeks, who hate the Persians, who fought the Persians, now start hiring themselves to be a phalanx, multiple phalanxes in the Persian army. In fact, Darius III could rightfully claim, when Alexander invades, he could rightfully claim more Greeks were fighting for him than for Alexander, because the Macedonians weren't Greek. And the Greeks didn't like Alexander, because Alexander was taking away their autonomia. Poor men start, and the Persians aren't dumb. They looked at this war and said, oh my God, the phalanx is way better than everything else. We better get some of our, we better have phalanxes. But Persian troops don't know how to fight in a phalanx, so they're just going to hire Greeks to fight in it. Athens becomes a university town. 
There's a little bit of politics, a little bit of economics, but really Athens becomes a university town. Philosophy and plays and schools, it becomes what it what you think of as Athens. Not great, not super rich, but a place dedicated to culture. So that when the Romans show up and they take Greek culture, they're really taking Athenian culture. But they don't know enough that it's not all the Greeks. They're like, oh, this Greek culture is really Athenian culture. And Athenian culture becomes Greco-Roman culture. So Athens is going to have cultural power rather than military power from here on in. This is also a trauma. Thucydides is going to write the second book of history. And he defines, he wants to know, how did this happen? How did this disaster happen? Now, he's going to die before the final battle happens. And his history will be ended by one of his students. But he's trying to understand why is this trauma happening? And he sees it as a conflict between the new power, Athens, and old powers, Sparta. Athens, he, but why is Athens losing? Because Athens lost its values. Athens was not the Athens. In 410, Athens is not the Athens of Pericles. The, the leaders after Pericles, Pericles will die in a, in a plague in like the third year of the war. The guys after them will be populares. They'll be generals. They'll be guys who are not worthy of being a democratic leader. They're lesser. And the Greeks are, and the Athenians are more greedy. They, they murder all the Milesians when they did it, when they wouldn't have done that earlier, 10 years earlier. In fact, Thucydides has a scene that's very similar to the Milesian debate where the city is spared, where they take uh, justice and pity. Athens lost its values. That's why it lost the war. You also get Socrates basically inventing modern philosophy because he was a soldier at Delium, D-E-L-I-U-M. He was a soldier in the Greek phalanx who got almost got murdered. He almost got speared by Theban horsemen. And so he's traumatized by this defeat. How does the world work where Athens, the greatest city in the whole wide world, can lose? How does the world work? How do people work where this terrible thing could happen? Sparta, they're the winner. And they end up in control of Greece. Ha ha! Because they're used to being a slave owner. So they're going to treat the rest of Greece as slaves. Not the same way as the helots, but like surprisingly close to the Athenian model. Like they don't want anyone else to fight. They don't want anyone else to be strong. And Greece is not happy with this. Greece did not give up a mistress to gain a master. And so you end up with war against Thebes and others. And at the Battle of Leuctra in 375, Thebes destroys the Spartan army, frees the helots, and destroys Sparta. Yeah, technically Sparta will exist well into the Alexander Age and even into the Roman Age. It's not the same Sparta. It's nowhere close to the same Sparta. It's like a band after all the original members have left. Thebes will run the show, which equals more war, because now Thebes, which doesn't have the legitimacy of Sparta, much less the wealth of Athens, is going to be like, we're in charge, freedom of the Greeks, except we're in charge. So they're going to run the show until Alexander and Philip show up. Philip shows up. Philip is Alexander's dad. Philip is going to make a new model army. He sees what's going on. He's in Macedonia. Macedonia is north of Greece, where the mountains of Greece start to level out and you start to get plains. And so you it's good horse country. It's it's the dividing line between the barbarian nomad, not nomads, but the barbarians of Thrace and Illyria and the cities of Greece. So it's this like not quite civilized, not quite urbanized place. And that's how the Greeks would treat them. They'd treat them like they're they're cousins, but they're like our weird hillbilly cousins. Well, Philip sees all this and he creates a new kind of army. He combines his Macedonian cavalry with the Greek phalanx, 
but instead of a 10 foot spear and a big shield, he gives it a 22 foot spear and no shield. This is an offensive army. He has figured out how to take the phalanx and put it on the move. See, even the Spartans have to fight in the mountains because if you get attacked by the side or from behind, you can't turn, you can't defend yourself, you will die. It can only fight forward. In fact, the, the, the Spartans were so good, they could turn. And it just freaked people out because no one else could do this. That's how good the Spartans were. They could turn. Well, Philip is going to put 5,000 horsemen on the side of those phalanxes. And he's going to give them a 22-foot spear. So they carry it in two hands, which means it could go anywhere. As long as that as horses, as long as that cavalry is on their side, they might as well be a mountain. And with that new army, that new offensive army, Philip conquers Greece. He's going to roll in. He's going to show his muscle. And most people are going to be like, yeah, okay, you win. He'll defeat Thebes. But mostly he just wants to get the money out of Greece. He just wants peace and quiet out of Greece. He's perfectly happy with the freedom of the Greeks. As long as the freedom of the Greeks means don't mess with me. Do whatever you want. Just don't mess with what I'm doing. And most Greek cities are like, yeah, okay, that's cool. Thebes, of course, is a pain in the butt. But they got beaten up, and so they're like, all right, all right, all right. Now what happens is Philip starts thinking about going to Persia. There's all those Greek cities there. There's a lot of money there. And it's good horse country, so his army will do well there. Especially in Ionia, in uh, Ionia and Asia Minor, to modern-day Turkey. Good horse country. Remember, remember the Lydians. So Philip's like, I can get to the Tarsus Mountains. I don't need to invade the entire Middle East. But I could get to, like, the Tarsus Mountains. And that's the Hittites. That's the Lydians. That's, that's a traditional good empire. Macedonia, Illyria, Thrace, Asia Minor, Greece. That is a good, good-sized empire. That's the civilized world. That's fine. And then he's murdered at his daughter's wedding. He's murdered by an ex-male lover. A boy toy, really. Um... So this is what you should learn from this is gentlemen and ladies, because we're in the modern world, um, always treat your exes well because Philip does not treat his ex boy toy well. The boy toy is replaced. The boy toy objects. Philip gets the boy toy drunk and then is like has him gang raped as punishment for talking back to the king. Um, that creates an animosity. And at the wedding, Boy Toy walks up to Philip, and Philip's like, what are you doing here? I mean, everyone was invited, but dude, really? You're here? And now you have to remember, Philip lost an eye in battle because he was badass. And a spear, like, splintered and went in his eye. And, like, so he wore this patch over one eye, a giant scar on his face. Philip was. You may go, oh, Philip was gay. Philip wasn't gay. He had, like, four wives. But he had a boy toy on the side. Philip was by far the manliest man of his lifetime, of the ancient world. There's Pericles. There's a couple of, of badass per, uh, Spartan generals during the Peloponnesian War. Brasades? No, that might be wrong. Um, there's Alcibiades, who's not badass. Alcibiades is, is in Athens. He's like a trickster. He's a sexy, sexy... Um, He's like if Todd Hiddleston, Tom Hiddleston was as Loki was a Athenian general, like that's what we're talking. He's sexy and smart, but he's always doing stories. Then there's E. Panamandus, a Theban general. Now he, he, he was a man amongst men. And then you got Philip. And Philip is the manliest man. Manliest man. And yes, he had sex with, with young men. And so he's like, what are you doing here, boy toy? I broke up with you. I replaced you with a younger, sexier model. I don't need you. You've been cut off. You can't use the Visa card anymore. You can't buy anything on Rodeo Drive. Get out of here. And the kid goes, who's now like in his early 20s, is like, I got something for you. Oh, what do you got? And out of his back comes this knife. And remember, everyone's armed. So it's not like no one was patting people down. Everyone carried something. He takes out a short knife and stabs him. 
right in the eye, right in the other eye. The blade goes through the eye, through his brain, stirs it around, like right out of something out of Homer, drops dead. He tries to flee. He's hit in the back with an axe. Done. Philip doesn't get to conquer the world. His son, 18-year-old Alexander, is like, I'm king. And everyone else is like, oh, yeah, we're a Macedonian. You've got father-in-law. You've got brothers-in-law. You've got an uncle. you got some... You, there's lots of people who are like, ah, uh, an 18-year-old boy is going to take over? F that. And Alex... This is where Alex becomes Alex. Alex murders, defeats allies with and plays the game of chess at court so well that he just gets rid of everybody and he ends up on top. Now, part of the reason why he bribed a whole lot of uncles, he bribed a whole lot of people with the, I, I'll pay you, I'm the king. He, he was a legitimate king. It's whether or not he could keep it. And he bribes a lot of people he defeats the Thracians in battle. But then the problem happens, and that's Thebes. Thebes revolts. Can he hold on to Greece? If Thebes goes, which is the largest northernmost city, the rest of Athens and Sparta will go too. They're less important at this point. But if you lose Thebes, you lose Greece. And Alex rolls in with his new, with his dad's army, his, his Macedonian cavalry, his phalangites with their 22 foot spears and he rolls in how dare you revolt against me and they're like well you're a boy you're nothing you're nobody and he's like i'm alexander the effing great and he rolls in and obliterates thebes he kills the tent he kills the sacred band the male homosexuals the best part of the theban army murders them to a person not happy about it because they won't run away, but he does murder them all. He destroys Thebes, wrecks the city. It doesn't exist. And then he turns to anybody else and goes, do you want to revolt? And everyone else goes, nope, 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 nope. And then he does the thing. You want to get rich? Come with me to Persia. And the Greeks go, woo, we're go, woo. So Alex invades Persia. He has to invade Persia. He's got to bribe the Greeks to be, be peaceful. He's got to bribe his Macedonian nobility to stay loyal and not murder him. And this becomes one of the great road trips in history. It is. It makes Alexander one of the most famous people in all. I mean, Alexander is on the level of Muhammad and Jesus in terms of name recognition. He is the first great Western conqueror. The Romans are in love with him. Historians in the early modern period will be in love with him because what he does is insane. It can't happen. Nobody else ever comes close to doing it. 10 years, 12,000 miles walked, four major battles in the Persian Empire, and then he's got two years in war in Afghanistan. Sieges. He conquers the Indus River Valley. Greek culture will replace Mesopotamian culture. The Greeks will loot the Eastern world. Trillions of dollars worth of gold is looted out of Lydia, Syria, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Iran, Afghanistan, and India. Trillions will go to Greece. It will take the Greeks 400 years to spend all of that money. Partly because the Romans will take it after 200 years. That money is so much money. There has The only thing that compares to the looting of the Eastern world by the Greeks is what the, what the, what the Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, and the English do in the Americas. There's simply no other place in history where so much of people's wealth was just carted off by another people. Tamerlane might come close. Tamerlane's pretty good. But there's just that level. It's trillions of dollars worth. The Greeks, for the next 200 years, will be rich on the money they stole 
out of the Persian world. Alexander will die. He's just exhausted. After all of this, he ends up back in Babylon and his body is exhausted. All the sex, all the wars, all the fighting, all the ba- all the scars. When he finally gets probably malaria, he dies. He just is not, his body cannot take the punishment anymore. And almost immediately his generals start fighting. Who gets this giant empire? There's nobody. Alexander had a wife, but she had no sons. He had, he actually, his wife was, Roxanne was from Afghanistan. She was pregnant. No, but nobody knew if that was going to be a boy. And the generals are like, uh, I hate you. And the other and the general say, well, I hate you back. And so what happens is they break it up. It breaks into three major parts. It will break into other little parts. And for the next 200 years, the Greeks will fight each other. They'll hire mercenary armies and they will fight each other in the Eastern Mediterranean. The big winner is probably Ptolemy, who will take over Egypt, the richest place in the world. He'll become Pharaoh. He will be the ancestor to Cleopatra, who will be the last of the Greek leaders. Remember, Cleopatra is not Egyptian. She's Greek. She's the last of the Greek leaders to survive the Roman conquest. She's the last one to be conquered. And her ancestor, 200 years earlier, Ptolemy the first was a homeboy of Alexander, was one of one of Alexander's school buddies. And so what we get is Alex dies, and instead of a giant Greek empire going to India, it breaks up. Now part of the Mesopotamian world will be part of will be part of Europe. Egypt will become European. Asia Minor, European. Mesopotamia, more or less European. Afghanistan, part of Europe. Afghanistan had the largest Greek population in the Eastern world, outside of Greece. They will make a Greco-Bactrian, Greco-Afghanistan empire, which will control India for a little, little bit. Until another one of Alexander's homeboys in India, Sandra Gupta Maurya, who we'll talk about when we do India, conquers the Indus River Valley, conquers the Ganges River Valley, and creates the Mauryan Empire. Using the same technology that the Greeks used to conquer it in the first place. And so what we have is the Greek culture wins. And that's where we will leave. Athens defeated. Sparta defeated. Thebes defeated. Alexander dead. But Greek culture, and by extension, Athenian culture, the strongest culture in the Mediterranean and Indian Ocean world. Stretching from from southern Italy and Sicily all the way to India. Greek plays, Greek art, Greek language, Greek schools, Greek economics, Greek government. Okay. In our next chapter, we're going to do culture. Congratulations. Be safe. See you soon.